Hello, my name is Mr. Asprey and this is 2022 Pure Paper 2 Maths Edexcel A Level. If you do enjoy the content that I'm posting, please do subscribe, that'd be much appreciated, and drop a like as they say. This paper was given with additional information and I would say that it was slightly easier than the first paper though there are some tricky questions particularly the parametrics at the end so do check that one out the grade boundaries for the total um, set of papers was 72 percent for an a star which is about standard maybe slightly lower than what we'd expect and it was 55 percent for an a and 43 percent for a b so very attainable um, and we do expect them to go slightly higher for 2023. Right, that's enough talking. Let's get into the action. Okay, question number one, we have a, a modulus graph and we are just simply asked to solve. Uh, where the modulus graph, which is already drawn for us, is equal to a line which looks like this, 7 plus x. Um, so the first thing I would do would be to sketch um, what 7 plus x looks like. Um, so I'm just going to roughly sketch it something like this, and it's going to have a positive gradient, so it's going to come across here, and it's going to cut twice, um, particularly because uh, the gradient of 1 is shallower than the gradient of 2, so it's going to be a shallower line, so it's going to cut twice. So that means I need to um, solve when my modulus is positive. I need to solve when my modulus is negative. OK, so if my modulus is positive, I just leave it exactly how it is and solve this equation. But if my modulus was negative, then I need to take the negative of this modulus, which means I can swap the signs around like so. Okay, and then it's as simple as just solving these two equations. Um, I'm going to write this is equal to um, 3 is equal to 7 plus 3x. I'm going to subtract 7 to get minus 4 is equal to 3x. So finally, x is equal to minus 4 over 3. And here I'm going to subtract an x from both sides. And this is going to then add 3, it's going to give me x is equal to 10. Okay, question number two. Sketch the curve. Well, if you're having trouble with this question, then you could always just go to your graph function. Um, you could always just uh, delete all of these and type in what the graph is. So 4 to the power of x. And there it is. And we can zoom in on that uh, interesting part in the um, in the center. And that intercept will be 1. So the graph is going to look like this. And how do I know it's going to go through 1? Well, when x equals 0, y is equal to 4 to the 0, which is equal to 1. And there we have it. They're the only, co uh, only intercepts. So whenever you sketch, you should always label your intercepts. And there is only one. So we're done. Um, and also, this will go on, and it will have an asymptote at x or y equals 0. So it will never touch the x-axis. Okay, now we need to solve this equation. We could take logarithms of both sides. So we could write log 4 to the x is equal to log of 100. We could bring the x down using our log rules because whenever we have um, log of a to the power x, that's the same as x log a. This gives me log 100 on this side. And then dividing through, we get x is equal to log 100 over log Four. Um, it asks us to do to two decimal places, 
So if you're rushing for your exam, you might miss that. It might give it in exact form. But they're actually asking me to give it in. Um, so I could write log of 100 over let's do it like that yes log of 100 over log of 4 and we get 3.32 okay question 3 um, we've got a sequence so it starts with um, 3 so the next sequence, uh, the next term in the sequence along, we need to replace the a n with a three. So we write a two is equal to eight minus three, which is equal to five. And the next one we sub in five, and we get three. And that means we get a repeat because we started with three, and now we have gone back to three. So that's a repeat, and it's taken us two steps to get there so we say that the period is two and now it's asking us to find the summation up to 85 terms where n equals one of this sequence and we know that the two terms are going to be 3 followed by 5 and let's multiply that by 42 because two terms that repeat 42 times is going to give us the first 84 terms and then the next term along will be um, a 3 because that's always the first one to appear out of the two so that's going to be our summation so we just type into our calculator 8 multiplied by 42 plus 3 and we get 339. Question 4 is a uh, differentiation from first principles. We're given the formula in our formula booklet um, that the derivative function is equal to as the limit of h tends to 0 f of x plus h minus f of x all over h well first off let's define what f of x is well it's the function we're trying to differentiate which is x uh, sorry 2x squared so if I replace the x with an x plus h it becomes two lots of x plus h squared so now I've got everything I need, I can just write that the derivative function is equal to the limit as h tends to 0 of f of h of f of x plus h, which is 2x plus h squared. Now what I'm, I'm going to multiply that out as well because, um, well, just save a bit of time, but x squared times by 2 will be 2x squared. We'll get an xh and another xh, so that would be 2xh, times by 2 is 4xh, and then we're going to get an h squared, times by 2 is 2h squared. Uh, and then we subtract f of x, which is 2x squared, and that's all divided by h. So this uh, that will cancel with this. And when we divide through by h, um, we will get just 4x, and we will get just 2h. And then as h tends to 0, 2h will tend to 0. So I can write as h tends to 0, comma, 2h tends to 0. And therefore, the derivative function is equal to just 4x.
Question five, we have a table of values and we've been asked to work out using the trapezium rule an estimate for the integral between nine and three of this function which luckily for us has been written out in terms of our table. Okay, so trapezium rule. We're given this in the formula booklet. Uh, the first thing we need to do though is figure out what the height is and that's the gap between the x values which is 1.5. So I say that the height is equal to 1.5. That's going to be useful. What is the formula for the trapezium rule? Well it tells us that the area is equal to h over 2 y0 plus 2 lots of y1 plus y2 plus all the way up to yn minus 1 plus yn. Well, first off, we know what the height is. We just worked it out, so that's 1.5. We can write that over, whoops, 1.5 over 2. Okay, y0, that's our value of y here, which is 1.63 plus two lots of all the ones in the middle, so 2 plus 2.6 plus 2.46 and then plus on a single of the one at the end. And that just goes straight into our calculator. So 1.5 over 2 open brackets 1.63 plus 2 lots of 2 plus 2.26 plus 2.46 close brackets plus 2.63 close brackets equals 13.275 okay does it say what degree of accuracy we need to give it for um, no so that will do then um, okay next it says using your answer to part A work out this next value well we can use our log rules to rewrite this as log base 3 2 to the x the 10 can come down to become the coefficient like this and then even more so, we can take 10 out because it's a constant multiplied by what's inside the integral. And then we're just left with exactly what we've already worked out. So part B, I, the answer will be 10 multiplied by what we had before, which is going to equal 132.75. Okay, um, the next one, again we've got to do a bit of rearranging. So we can write this as the integral between 9 and 3 of log base 3. So we really want 2x, so that's going to be 9 times 2x. And when we have um, a logarithm where the input is multiplied two things are multiplied together, we could write it as those two logs separately added together. Like this, still again integrating between 9 and 3. Now what is log base 3 of 9? Well, that's asking the question, what power of 3 do I need to raise in order to get 9? Well, the answer is 2, because 9 is equal to 3 to the 2. So that's just 2. So I can rub that out and write 2. Okay, great. So let's integrate this now. When I integrate 2, it goes to 2x between 9 and 3. And I've already worked out this part. We know that answer. That's 13.275. We don't need to do that again. So subbing in here, we're going to get um, 18 minus, and then 2 times 3 is 6. 
and that's going to give us a total of adding on 12 to that, so 25.275. Question six, we have a, a beautiful looking curve and we are asked to work out the X coordinate of the point P. Now what do we know about P? So P is a local maximum point of the curve right here. And um, so in order to work out the, the maximum point, we are gonna differentiate and set equal to zero. So if I take my function, and if I differentiate it, I am going to, well we know that sine differentiates to cos, and the input is a half x, so we need to multiply by the derivative of the input, and the derivative of the input is a half, and a half times 8 is 4, so it's 4, and then a half x. Uh, minus 3x differentiates to 3, and we set that equal to 0. Okay, this gives us that cos of a half x is equal to uh, 3 over 4. And now before I start solving, I'm just going to figure out which, um, which point am I actually looking for here. Uh, because I can see that there is actually a, um, there's a stationary point there. And there's also a stationary point there. So the one I'm looking for is the third stationary point on the graph, or the, at least where, um, where x is greater than 0. So I'm looking for the third positive value for cosine. Right, so I go to my calculator, and I'm in radian mode, which I believe the question is asking us to... Yes, it says that x is measured in radians. So I'm in radian mode and I'm going to do um, shift cos of um, 3.5 or sorry 3 over 4 or 0.75 and I'm going to get my first value for a half x whoops my first value for a half x will be uh, 0 0.7227 now how do you find your second value for cos well we should know that cos is 2 pi minus to get the second value so I'll do um, I will do 2 pi whoops struggling here 2 pi minus the answer okay that gives us our second value which is 5.56 but again we're not interested in that we're actually interested in the third value so once I've got my first and second values to get more values I just add 2 pi to each of these two. So adding 2 pi to the first one is going to give me the value which I'm actually looking for. So let me just um, delete this line and let's just do 2 pi plus answer and we get 7. So adding 2 pi to 0 0.7 227 gives us 7.01 7.01 and that's a half x so we want to double that so that's going to give me 14.02 uh, to three significant figures so that is just 14.0 okay and that says the curve crosses the x-axis at x equals alpha as shown in figure 2 given to that to three decimal places f of 4 is equal to a positive number and f of 5 is equal to a negative number explain why lambda so alpha must lie within the interval so this is just um, we, we write that um, as f of 4 is negative and f of 5 positive and f of x is continuous on the interval between 4 and 5 there is 
at least one root between four and five. So classic change of sign. If you see a change of sign and the graph is continuous between those two x values, then there must be a root in between. Next, we're applying the newton raphson method once, taking x0 is equal to 5 to obtain a second approximation for alpha. Well, the newton raphson method states that um, the next approximation is equal to the last one minus f of um, xn over f dash of xn. We're given that formula in our formula booklet. So we're going to start with x0 equals 5. So we're going to go for uh, 5 there. We're going to sub 5 into the function, which is 8 sine half of 5 minus 3 times 5 plus 9. So that was 8 sine half of 5 minus 3 times 5 plus 9 all over the derivative which was 4 cos a half of 5 um, minus 3 I believe great so let's just do some calculator techers and let's hope we don't make any mistakes so that would be embarrassing uh, 3 times 5 is 15 plus 9 and then 4 cos of, always put in brackets on this big calculator, so otherwise it will mess you up. And you get 4.80. Lovely. And we are golden. Okay, classic binomial. So I can see here that we are going to rewrite this as a power of a half because the square root is the same as raising it to the power of a half. And our binomial formula is always 1 plus x to in this case to the power of a half, uh, but we'd say to the power of n. And it's equal to 1 plus nx plus n n minus 1 over 2 factorial x squared plus and then carrying on with that pattern. So we need to have it in terms of 1 but at the moment it's in terms of a 4. So what we can do is we can factorize out 4 from this bracket and when we do that we have to take the power with it. Then we can divide everything inside the bracket by 4 and then we have our binomial in the form in which we can use the formula. So we write here um, 2 because 4 to the half is 2. And then we have our first term is 1. The next term is the power multiplied by the x. So in this case it's a half multiplied by the x which is minus 9 over 4x. And then we have um, uh, n which again is the power multiplied by the power minus 1 over 2 factorial which is 2 and then x squared, which is minus 9 over 4x squared. Always remember to put the squared outside so it affects the x and the, in this case, minus 9 over 4 coefficient. And how many more do we need? It says the first four terms. We've got 1, 2, 3, so we need another one. So we're going to do a half, minus a half, again, minus the next, minus 1 again, so minus 3 over 2, over 3 factorial, which is 6, and then minus 9 over 4, whoops, x cubed, close bracket. Okay, um, evalu evaluating these terms before I times them by 2. So we have 1 minus 9 over 8x, and next we would get a negative and it will be 81 on top because you've got 9 squared and you've got a 2, 2, 2 and then 4 and a 4 
which is going to be 128x squared. And next, you're going to have two negatives cancelling, but then you're going to get three negatives. So that's going to be a negative overall. And then you're going to get 9 to the 3 and another 3. And that's going to give you, but then divide by 3, so 7 to 9. And then count up all the 2s on the bottom. And that will be uh, 10, 24. Of course, you can just put that into your calculator to get that. Um, OK, and then we've got to multiply by 2. So we're going to get 2 minus 9 over 4x minus 81 over 64x squared minus 7 to 9 over 5, 1, 2, x cubed. OK, next part says a student uses the expansion with x equals 1 ninth. Well, if I sub in 1 ninth, I get 9 multiplied by a ninth, which is going to give me root 3. OK, so that sounds like a reasonable idea. But without doing any calculations, state whether the approximation will be an overestimate or an underestimate. Give a brief reason for your answer. Well, this binomial, which we've just calculated, is going to converge upon, in this case, root 3. Um, and it's going to get closer and closer to root 3 every single term that you, in this case, take away. So because all of the terms after 2 are negative, we will have an overestimate. Because what you can imagine happening here is every time, if we go further and further with the sequence, like for example the next one which will be an x to the 4, we're chipping away another bit off and we're getting closer to root 3. So we keep chipping away, which means we must be greater than it in order for us to chip away and arrive closer and closer to root 3. Question number 8. We have a sketch of a curve and a region defined. The curve is given and it just asks us to work out the area. OK, well, the first thing I can spot is well, when is um, when is y equal to 0? When does it cross the axis? Well, whenever I have a fraction like this and I want to set it equal to 0, it's just the numerator that needs to be 0. And those are factorized brackets, so the values that make them 0 are 2 and 4. So that's 2 and that's 4. Now, integrating this does not look pretty. There's no sort of chain, uh, sorry, quotient rule for integrating. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to multiply out the brackets and that's going to give me x squared minus 2x and a minus 4x makes a minus 6x and a plus 8. And that's all divided by 4x to the half. Now in order for me to integrate um, I would like to have each x term expressed um, independently. So I'm going to look at this x squared and when I divide that by 4 um, a half x or sorry 4 x to the half I'm going to get 1 quarter and I'm going to get x to the 3 over 2 because when I divide x's I need to subtract the powers and 2 subtract a half is, is 1 and a half or 3, 3 over 2. Um, next, 6 divided by 4 is 3 over 2. And x to the 1 divided by x to the half is x to the half. And then finally, I've got 8 divided by 4, which is 2. And I've got, um, well, just an x to the half on the bottom. So that's x to the minus half. And I want to integrate this between the points... Uh, 4 and 2 with respect to x. OK, so the power goes up to 5 over 2. And then I divide by the new power. So a quarter 
um, divided by 5 over 2 is a tenth. Up the power to 3 over 2. Divide by 3 over 2. Well, that cancels out the 3 over 2. Perfect. And here, up the power, I'm going to get x to the half. And dividing by a half is the same as timesing by 2. So it gives you a 4. And I need to do this and this. And that's between 4 and 2. OK, so to get the full marks, I'm going to want to evaluate each term. It's going to be pretty boring. Um, and I can't really imagine that anyone's going to be staying around watching this. But if you are, thanks. Um, 16 over 5. And um, can we do this one? We can. Square root gives you 2. Cube gives you 8. And square root gives you 2. Times by 4 gives you 8. OK, great. And now let's do it for 2. Um, let's go back up to here and just sub in 2 for this one. And we get 2 root 2 over 5. OK, subbing in 2 will be 2 to the power of 3 over 2, which is 2 root 2. And subbing in 2 here is going to give me 4 root 2. OK, simplifying, I'm going to get uh, 16 over 5 minus, we're going to add up all of these root 2s in this bracket, and it's going to give me 12 over 5 root 2. Now that's a negative value, so that can't be the area. And that does make sense as well, because we're going to get a negative area because we're looking at the area underneath the axis. So when I integrate, that will give me a negative value. So if I want to work out the actual area, I need to take the absolute value of that. So the absolute value of 16 over 5, 12 over 5 root 2. And that's just going to be, if I just swap them around, that will give me the positive value rather than the negative value. And that's the exact value. Question 9, a uh, Ferris wheel question. These are quite popular with Edexcel. They like a Ferris wheel. And it gives you a sketch of the graph. And it gives you the formula for the graph. And it also tells you some key bits of information here. Maximum height is 50 meters. The passenger is 1 meter above the ground when the wheel starts turning. And the wheel takes 720 seconds to complete one revolution. Find a completed equation for the model. OK, so first off, let's use that first bullet point, max height. And we know at max height, or at maximum, any sine function uh, is equal to 1. So therefore, we can say that 50 is equal to a, essentially, because, again, that sine function would be 1. That's the maximum the sine function could take. So let's maximize it out to 1, which gives me 50 equals a. Um, next part, it says it's 1 meter above the ground when the wheel starts turning. So that means when t equals 0. So we can do t equals 0, 1 is the height, 50, sine, because t is 0, alpha. So therefore we have 1 over 50 equals sine alpha. So therefore alpha is equal to inverse sine of 1 over 50. So we go to our calculator, making sure that we are in degree mode, because I've just spotted that there's a degree sign there and a degree sign there. So very cheeky, just trying to trip you up there for no 
good reason, is at Excel. So we go shift sign. Oh, whoops, I need to make sure I'm in degree mode. Shift sign of 1 over 50. Brilliant, 1.15. Okay, nearly done, and we're going to use the third bit of information to find B. It says the wheel takes us 720 seconds to complete one revolution. Well, one revolution looks like this, and we know that normally a sign graph would go up to there at 180. Um, but it's actually going to take 720, so that's going to be stretched by a scale factor of 4. Now, how do you stretch a graph in the x-axis by a scale factor of 4? Well, you change the input into 1 over 4. So therefore, we can say that b is equal to 1 over 4, because if you multiply the variable inside the bracket of the function, by a scale by a heart by a, a quarter sorry that's going to stretch it in the x-axis by a scale factor of four thus stretching out that 180 all the way to 720. Okay it now says explain why an equation of the form blah blah oh, uh, would be more appropriate. Um, okay if, if you add something on it's going to lift this graph up so the graph would then look like um, this. And that's going to be better because the um, it doesn't touch uh, zero. You don't want a Ferris wheel going around and scraping along the floor. So moving it up will mean that the height is never zero. Um, uh, it'd be more appropriate um, as the height will never be zero and thus the carriages um, won't scrape the floor. Let's go with some functions. So the inverse function of 3 over 2. Now I could find the inverse function, but that would take me ages. Um, in fact, what we know is that if we have a, a domain, and let's say we have an x value, then if we put that through the function, that will give you some value. Let's say if it gives you 3 over 2, then if I take the inverse of 3 over 2, uh, sorry, the inverse function of 3 over 2, that will take me back to the x value. So what is the x value that when I pass it through the function gives me 3 over 2? Well, it means I just need to solve what is the x which gives me 3 over 2. So I need to solve this equation. Like that. Sorry, that should be a 2x. Okay, so that's what I need to solve. Um, multiplying this denominator over there and this denominator over here is going to give me 16 plus 10 is equal to 6x plus 9. Sorry, that should be 16x. So that's going to give me 10x is equal to minus 1, so x is equal to minus 1 tenth. And those are the two marks. Uh, part B asked me to show that I can write the function as a integer number, uh, or a constant should I say, and then plus some sort of remainder after I've divided. So I can set up my fraction as the numerator 
divided by the denominator. And I can do algebraic division. Let's take the two lead terms and ask ourselves the question, what do I get if I divide 8x by 2x? Do I get 4? And then multiplying down like this, if I had 4, that would give me 8x plus 12. I subtract, and I get minus 7, and that is my remainder. It means that I can write my function now as 4 complete 2x's plus 3 minus 7 remainders of 2x plus 3. Okay, great. Um, next, we're talking about ranges. Um, state the range of um, g of x. Well, let's go back to our first example over here. Okay, this is the domain of the function, and this is the range of the function, what comes out of the function. And you'll notice that that will be the domain, what you put into the inverse and the domain of the original function will be the range of the inverse function. So basically, the range of g of x, sorry, the range of g inverse of x is equal to the domain of g of x. And that is between 0 and 4. So therefore, our answer is between 0 and 4, but we must write, as it is a range, we must write g to the minus 1 of x, because it's the range of the inverse function of g. Okay, now we're asked to work out the range of f of g inverse. So what does that mean? Well, that means that I take my, um, my, my inverse of g and I put all of its values I can into f. So the values that g inverse can take are between 0 and 4, like we've already worked out. And then I've got to put those into f. And let's just remember what f is. Well, I've got it right here, actually. I'm going to use this version of f. It's going to make it easier. So it's 4 minus 7 lots of 2 multiplied by x plus 3. So let's start off by putting in the lowest possible value that um, we could sub into f, um, which would be 0. Because again, the inverse of g can take only values between 0 and 4. So the lowest we can sub in would be 0. And this would give me... Um, 4 minus 7 over 3, which would be uh, 5 over 3. And then what we can do is we can take the maximum value that the inverse of g can give us to sub into f, and that would be 4. And that would give me 4 minus 7 over 11, which would give me um, 37 over 11. Okay, so it looks like we are bounded between these two values. So the range of f of g inverse is between 5 over 3 and 37 over 11. Okay, this is a classic proof question, and we've got to prove that it's even, so we're going to check to see if it's even for all even numbers and for all odd numbers. So we're going to start by letting n equal 2k, where k is a natural number, and substituting in, that's going to give me 2k, uh, 2k all squared plus 5, 
which is 2k 4k squared plus 5 which is definitely a even number because we can write that as two lots of 4k cubed plus 5k so we can say which is even for all evens and then we can let n equal 2k plus 1 where k is a natural number again subbing in we're going to get 2k plus 1 2k plus 1 all squared plus 5 so 2k plus 1 all squared we're going to get 4k squared and get plus a 2k plus another 2k so that's plus 4k and plus 1 and we've got plus 5 there and we're going to multiply that by 2k plus 1 okay um, right so what we could do I, I don't want to expand out as many I want to save as much time as possible so I can write this as 4k squared plus 4k plus 6 now this bracket has a factor of 2 and that's all we need we just need one factor of 2 so let's bring that outside and rather than multiplying all these brackets together I can just take a factor out of that and that is enough to prove that it's even so we can say even for all odds and we can say as n n squared plus 5 is even for all evens and odds it is even for all n exists in the natural numbers question 12 um, we have a function and we've been asked to uh, show that the derivative is equal to um, some other function so let's differentiate this is a quotient because I can tell that because it's something divided by something else so I can let u equal the numerator and v equal the denominator and then we need to find uh, the derivative of u which will be 3e e to the 3x and the derivative of v which will be 8x and the constant will differentiate to 0 okay using the quotient rule which is given in our formula booklet so I won't write it out I'll just apply it so we start with v which is 4x squared plus k and we multiply that by du which is 3e e to the 3x and then we subtract the other cross product here which is 8x multiplied by e to the 3x and then we divide by v squared which always makes things really messy and annoying but it's what you got to do okay so let's simplify um, we are um, what should we do here should we simplify how are we gonna get 12x squared ah yeah okay let's 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 multiply it all out and see what happens so 12x squared e to the 3x plus 3k e to the 3x minus 8x e to the 3x okay so we're going to take out a factor of e to the 3x from the numerator and we should get that polynomial there which we're looking for so we will take out a factor of e to the 3x and we'll be left with 12x squared plus 3k minus 8x uh, they want it the other way around so I'll just swap them over minus 8x plus 3k and that's all divided by this 
So that tells me that g of x, I can state that, is everything other than that nice polynomial. So what's left over is the light blue, which are these two bits. So it's e to the 3x over 4x squared plus k squared. It says, given that the curve has at least one stationary point, at least one stationary point. So that means that when I set the derivative equal to zero, we're only going to get one root. Now, how is this derivative going to equal zero? Well, the only way it can equal zero is if the green part equals zero. Because when we have a fraction, it's only the numerator that needs to equal zero. And the e to the 3x will never equal zero. So it's just the green bit. So I need to check how many roots this has. Well, in fact, sorry, um, I've been told how exactly it has at least one stationary point. And we know that the, the discriminant of a, pol of a quadratic, if it's less than zero, no roots. If it's equal to zero, one root. And if it's greater than zero, two roots. So at least one means zero or greater than zero. So I'm going to write b squared minus 4ac needs to be equal to or greater than zero. The b term is minus 8. Square that gives me 64. Minus 4 times 12 times 3k. So that's 64. Um, uh, that's 144. So therefore, we can say that, um, how am I going to do this? 64 is greater than or equal to 144k. Divide through by 16 gives me 4 and gives me 9. So therefore, my final answer is k is less than or equal to 4 over 9. It does say that k is a positive constant. So technically, you might want to, you have to write this. Uh, but checking the mark scheme, this is acceptable. So you don't need to write uh, that it's greater than 0. Okay, question number 13, vectors. I absolutely love vectors. Uh, given that ABC lie on a straight line. So first off, I'm thinking, let's draw a picky. A, B, and C, and then set the origin somewhere like that. Um, find the value of P. Okay. Well, if they lie on a straight line, then a to b, which we can calculate, is parallel to b to c. They're going in the same direction. So let's do that. a to b, which we know is ob minus oa. So be very careful here. There's no i, so we have to put 0 for i. It's very tempting just to start with 4. And then take away a, which is 4 minus 3, 5. And that gives us minus 4, 7, and 1. That's parallel to b to c, which is oc minus ob. Um, OC is minus 16, P 10, and B is 0, 4, 6 again. So we get minus 16, P minus 4, 
and we get six. No, careful. We get four. Okay, so we know they're parallel. So we know that AB is some multiple of BC or vice versa. Um, so what is that multiple? Well, let's look. Let's look at this component here. It's been times by four. Does the other component agree? Yes, it does. So therefore, the middle component must also agree. So we can say that seven multiplied by four will equal P minus four, which means that 28 is equal to P minus four, which means that P is equal to 32. Fantastic. Okay, this next question takes some getting your head around. So again, it's important to try and draw a picture here, a little diagram like I've done already. It says the line segment OB is extended. Like such. Um, to a point D. Such that C to D. is parallel to O to A, like that. Find O to D. Okay, so we know that um, OD was an extension of OB, so it's something multiplied by OB, so it could be twice as long or three times as big. We, we don't know, but it, it's something, it's some multiple of OB. So therefore, it is lambda multiplied by OB, which we know already OB is 4J plus 6K. So 0, 4, 6. Okay, now let's look at the two red lines. So let's first look at C to D which we can write as OD minus OC. So this will be um, OD, which we've already worked out. It's some lambda multiplied through by four and, uh, sorry, zero, four, six. OC we know already, that's minus 16. P was 32 and 10, so minus 16, 32, and 10. So we can get an expression for C to D, and that will be 16, four lambda minus 32, and six lambda minus 10. Now we know that CD is parallel to OA. And let's remind ourselves what OA is. OA is, 4 minus 3, 5. 4 minus 3, 5. So again, how do these compare? Let's look at the I component. Well, we can see that because they're parallel, they have to be a multiple of one another. So we need to multiply OA by 4 to get to CD. So it's 4 times as big. Okay, so what does that mean? It means that um, minus 3 multiplied by 4 will equal the uh, middle component here, which is uh, 4 lambda minus 32, which tells us that 4 lambda is equal, sorry, let's not skip ahead too much, so minus 12 is equal to 4 lambda minus 32, so therefore we can say that 20 is equal to 4 lambda, so lambda equals 5. And we're still not even not even done yet. That tells us what lambda is, which tells us what OD is. Because remember, the first thing we started off was giving an expression for OD in terms of lambda. So O to D is equal to lambda, which is 5, multiplied by 0, 4, 6, which is 0, 20, 30. So finally, the modulus of OD is equal to the square root of its components, which is 0 plus 20 squared plus 30 squared. And that is um, uh, 
a whole lot of work for not many marks. Pretty stingy there at Excel. Only three marks for that. That is really stingy because that takes a picture understanding and a fair bit of algebra. Oh well, it was fun doing it. Question 14. Got some partial fractions. Okay. 3, 2x minus 1, x plus 1. So let's just write that down here. 3, 2x minus 1, x plus 1. And we want that to be some number over 2x minus 1 plus something else over x plus 1. We're going to multiply through... 2x minus 1 and x plus 1. So that will give me 3 because both of those uh, brackets on the bottom will cancel because so I multiplied through by them. And I'll get a lots of the 2x minus 1 will cancel but the x plus 1 will remain. And here the x plus 1 will cancel but the 2x minus 1 will remain. We then let x equal minus 1 because it will solve this bracket here with the x plus 1. 3 will stay the same there. The minus 1 will cancel this bracket here, which is next to the a. And minus 1 times 2 is minus 2. Minus another one is minus 3. So minus 3b, which tells me that b is equal to negative 1. And then I will let x equal a half. Again, 3 stays the same because it's not dependent on x at all, it's just 3. And we have a half plus 1, which is uh, 3 over 2, so a times by 3 over 2, um, which means that a is equal to 2. So we can write as partial fractions um, that 3 2x minus 1, x plus 1 is equal to um, 2 over 2x minus 1 minus 1 over x plus 1. Okay, great. Now there is lots and lots to read here. Ugh, not really going to be bothered to read it all. Uh, I'm just going to look at the most important part, which is the equation that you need to solve. But this is important because it says after two hours, we have three millimeters, sorry, meters cubed. So we're going to use that as our boundary condition to work out whatever constant is left over after integrating. So let's rearrange this equation, this differential equation that we've been given. And I'm just going to do it on the side here so that I've got it written up. I'm going to multiply by dt and I'm going to take this v and I'm going to divide it down this side. So I will get dv and I've divided through both sides by v and I've multiplied by dt so that's gone over to the other side so it's 3 lots of 2 minus 2t two minus 1 t plus 1 dt Okay, now that's helpful because that is exactly the same as our partial fraction. Um, with the x being replaced for t. Okay, so what does that tell us? It means I can rewrite this differential equation as uh, 1 over v dv, which was the left side. And the right side was just this perfect partial fraction. So it was 2, 2x minus 1, minus 1 over x plus 1. Oh, sorry, it was t. That was the only difference between the partial fraction and the actual equation we're meant to solve, is that it's now a t. And I've still put x. Come on, sort it out. And that's dt, which means we can integrate both sides. Okay, the integral of 1 over v is ln v. And this is a perfect 
um, lin rule uh, integral because we've got the derivative of 2t is 2 so it's perfectly set up so I could just write ln of 2t minus 1 and this one's also perfectly set up because again the derivative of t is just 1 so don't have to mess around with any constants here I can literally just write minus ln of t plus 1 and of course we get plus c now we use that uh, those boundary conditions so t is equal to 2 because t is measured in hours that is definitely worth checking and 3 is the volume which is measured in meters cubed perfect so t equals 2 v equals 3 t equals 2 v equals 3 gives me that ln v uh, ln 3 sorry is equal to ln 2 times 2 is 4, minus 1 is 3, minus ln 3, plus c. Great, so c is equal to ln 3. So we have ln v is equal to ln 2t minus 1, minus ln t plus 1, plus ln of 3. We can combine the LUNs on the right hand side. So we have this one is positive and this one is positive. So we can times them together to get LUN of open brackets three lots of 2t minus 1. And this one is negative. So we would divide by that one, which would be t plus 1 like that. Whoops, and no need for the brackets, in fact. Okay, so LUN rules again. LUN rules state that if you uh, add two LUNs together, you can write it as uh, the product of those two values, so 3 and 2t minus 1. And if you subtract, you can then divide through by that, uh, in this case, the blue one, t plus 1. Okay, and now we've got LUNs on both sides, so therefore we can cancel the LUNs, which gives us that v is equal to 3, 2t minus 1 over t plus 1. And I think that was a show that question, actually. Yeah, it's actually told, it's actually given us the answer. Fantastic. Okay, right. Oh, I hate these questions at the end. Little two markers. There was a time delay between the chemicals being mixed and oxygen being produced. The time, work out the time delay. So let's check what happens when V equals zero. Well, again, as I think I've said about three times in this, in this video, but when you want a fraction to equal zero, you just need the top to equal zero. So three, two T minus one equals zero, which means that T is equal to a half. So that means that the volume um, starts um, from zero after 30 seconds or 30 minutes. So that's the time delay. Because prior to that, the volume was negative, which the model is therefore useless. So the model only gets started once uh, t is equal to a half. So the answer is 30 minutes for that one. And then the limit. Well, in order to check the limit, we just send t to a really big number, like infinity, for example. Um, and that would give me, um, when I multiply out the brackets anyhow, I get 6 lots of infinity um, minus 3, which is just 6 lots of infinity, uh, over uh, infinity plus 1, which is just infinity. So we're going to end up with 6. So that means that as t gets huge, there's going to be a limit of 6 meters cubed. Let's go. Question 15. Geometric series, and we've got some trig terms. Show that this quadratic in terms of sine equals zero. Okay, so what do we know about geometric series? We know that if I were to multiply this first term by r, 
then that would be the same as if I multiply this term by R. So let's do it. Let's say that 12 cos theta multiplied by R is equal to 5 plus 2 sine theta. And also 5 plus 2 sine theta multiplied by R is equal to 6 tan theta. So let's rearrange for R and we get 5 plus 2 sine theta over 12 cos theta and over here we get 6 tan theta over 5 plus 2 sine theta and because the R must be the same because they're in a geometric series we can equate these two together so we can say that these two are equal and then we can get tricky with it and come up with some identity so let's multiply each side up so that one goes up there and this one goes up there and that's going to give me um, 5 plus 2 sine theta squared is equal to 6 tan multiplied by 12 cos multiplying this out I'm going to get 4 sine squared and I get a 10 sine theta and another 10 sine theta so 20 sine theta and I'm going to get 5 times 5 is 25 and what is tan? well tan is um, sorry tan theta is sine theta over cos theta so I can write that as 6 sine theta over cos theta uh, times by 12, 6 times 12 is 72 uh, cos theta and dividing and times it by cos theta will cancel so bringing it all over to one side gives me sine squared and then uh, 20 minus 72 is minus 52 plus 25 equals 0 Uh, solve the equation and give the correct answer for theta uh, given that theta is an obtuse angle measured in radians okay um, ah, I'm just going to be lazy and uh, go to my um, oh no I'm not actually no 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 I've just spotted this this can um, factorize rather easily actually because the AC is uh, 4 times 25 and the B is minus 52 and the two numbers that times give us to make 100 and add to give minus 52 are minus uh, 2 and 50 so I can write 4 sine theta 4 sine theta all over 4 minus 2 minus 50 and dividing through by 4 means I could divide this bracket by 2 and I could divide this bracket by 2 great now which ones are going to give us viable solutions Well, only the left hand side because if that equals 0 the right hand side then sine theta would be 25 over 2 which is way bigger than 1 and of course sine theta has to be between minus 1 and 1 so we get here that sine theta is equal to one half. Um, so therefore theta is equal to um, pi over six. And it's the obtuse angle. And for sine, uh, we do one pi minus the angle in order to get the second solution. So the solution which I'm looking for is pi minus, which is five pi over six. And that is the obtuse one, so that is the good one.
Okay, so show that the sum to infinity of the series can be expressed in the form of k1 minus root 3. Well, the, um, sorry, the sum to infinity, first off, is given in your formula booklet as a1 minus r, where a is the first term. Now, a is uh, 12 cos theta. So we can write that a is um, 12 cos theta. We know what theta is, so a is equal to 12 cos of 5 pi over 6. And that is, um, if I just go to menu uh, radians and we go to shift, oh no, sorry, we go to uh, cos of 5 pi over 6, we get minus root 3 over 2. And we're going to times that through by 12, so that will be minus 6 root 3. Okay, great, so that's the A value, and now let's look at the R value. Um, now R, we express two ways. Um, and I'm going to go with this one because we've already worked out what 12 cos theta is. So it would probably be easier than working out what the other one is. So R is 5 plus 2 sine theta over 12 cos theta. Uh, so R is equal to 5 plus 2. Now what's sine theta? Well, we know what sine theta is. It's right here. It's a half. And what's 12 cos theta? Well, we've just worked it out in the last part. It's minus 6 root 3. So this gives us a total of 6 over minus 6 root 3, which is just minus 1 over root 3. OK, so let's put it into our summation formula now. Um, a is minus 6 root 3 and 1 minus r which is minus 1 over root 3. Okay, so let's, um, let's multiply the top and bottom by root 3. I think that will help. Um, this will give us minus 18 on the top and this will give us root 3 down there, and these two will give me, um, uh, the root 3's will cancel, so just minus 1, but there's a minus minus 1, so it's plus 1. Okay, now we can use some of our GCSE knowledge to rationalize this uh, denominator by multiplying it by root 3 minus 1 over root 3 minus 1, and this gives me minus 18 root 3, min plus 18, all over um, root 3 times root 3 is 3, and 1 times minus 1 is minus 1, so that gives me 2, and the other terms will cancel, that's the whole reason why we, we do it. So in total I get minus 9 root 3 plus 9, and I think they wanted it as 1 minus root 3 factorized so we can take out a 9 and that works and I think that is what they asked for yes it is great and we march on to the final question okay question 16 is a real humdinger difficult question but let's get it um, Use the parametric, use parametric differentiation to show the normal essentially at this particular point. Okay, so parametric differentiation. Um, you're going to start by differentiating the y with respect to t, or the x. I don't know why I chose the y. Um, now, the two is going to come down and multiply by the two to make four. 
we keep what's inside of the bracket, which in this case is sec t, the same, and we drop the power down by 1. Uh, but then we multiply by the derivative of um, inside the bracket, and that is sec tan. The derivative of sec is sec tan, which is in your formula booklet. So therefore, the uh, derivative of the y um, uh, equation is sec, and a sec makes sec squared, and we've also got tan as well. Okay, now we can work out the, um, we can differentiate the x, and um, tan differentiates the sec squared, so it's 2 sec squared t. Okay, so dy by dx is equal to this one, the y divided by the x. So we say 4 sec squared t tan t over 2 sec squared t. And this is going to simplify down to 2 tan t. Lovely. Now we need to um, investigate the point where t is equal to pi over 4. So the gradient at the point pi over 4 is equal to two lots of tan pi over 4 and 45 and tan of 45 is 1 so it's just 2 so the gradient is 2 at that point but we need to work out the normal gradient which is the negative reciprocal so the normal gradient is equal to minus 1 half Okay, so let's finish this off down. Oh no, no, we're not. Um, let's finish this off down here. Yeah, just get a bit more space. Okay, so we've got at the moment the gradient is equal to um, negative a half, and now we need to work out an x y coordinate in order to find equation of a, of a line. And we know that the point on the line we're looking at is where t is equal to pi over four. So let's sub that into the x, and let's sub that into the y. Let's just remind ourselves of those equations. 2 tan t plus 1. So 2 tan plus 1. And the other one was 2 sec squared plus 3. Okay, once again, uh, tan of pi over 4 is just 1, so we're going to end up with 2 plus 1, which is 3. And we, we, we know that sec is um, 1 over cos, and pi over um, 4 of cos, let's, just, let's go to our calculator here just to make sure. Um, so cos of... In fact, let's just put it straight in. So we do 2 over, open brackets, cos, open brackets, pi over 4, close brackets, close brackets, squared. Um, and then we need to plus 3 to that. And we get 7. Marvellous. So I've got everything I need. I've got an xy pair, um, a coordinate on the line, and I've got the gradient. So I just need to do y minus y1 is equal to mx minus x1. So y minus 7 is equal to minus 1 half x minus 3. So y minus 7 is equal to... Um, sorry, which... They wanted it in the form... Oh, the form y equals mx plus c, perfect. Minus a half x and then plus 3 over 2. So we're going to get y is equal to minus 1 half x and add 7 to that is going to give you uh, 17 over 2. And that's what they've asked for, perfect. 
And now it's asking us to show that all the points on C satisfy this Cartesian equation. So that means I need to take my two parametric equations and convert them into a Cartesian equation. Okay, so let me just write them down below here and then we can get cracking. So it was 2 tan t plus 1 and it was y equals 2 sec squared t plus 3. Now I know how tan and sec are related um, and I can show that by starting off with cos squared plus sine squared equals 1 uh, dividing through by, well, I, I want to I want to achieve a sec squared ideally. So if I divide through by cos squared over here, that's going to give me a sec squared on the right. So that's useful, and this gives me one plus sine over cos is tan, but sine squared over cos squared is tan squared, and that's equal to sec squared. Okay, so essentially. Um, um, uh, tan squared is equal to sec squared minus 1. So let's get an expression for tan squared over here and I could do that by subtracting 1 from both sides and then dividing through by 2. That's going to give me tan t and then squaring is going to give me x minus 1 over 2 all squared and that's equal to tan um, squared like that um, and then if I add one to both of these then I can replace my tan squared plus one with a um, with a sec squared so that, that can just be completely replaced like that so those two things are the same so I could write that y is equal to, so that sec squared is now the same as 1 plus x minus 1 squared over uh, 2 squared, which is 4, uh, close brackets, um, plus 3. So I will get uh, 2 multiplied by uh, 1 plus 3 is 5, and times in 2 by this bracket, which is um, over 4 will then become over 2 and I believe that is what they have asked for uh, yes it is great okay um, it then says that this straight line here intersects this curve at two distinct points find the range of possible values for k well if these two things are um, going to intersect, then they must be equal to each other, so we must solve them simultaneously. And seeing as they're both equal to y, that gives us um, an, an easy route in. We just set them equal to each other. So I say um, uh, 5 plus... Um, x minus 1 squared over 2 is equal to the line which is a half x plus k. And let's just double check that. Yep. And because um, um, these are intersecting and we know they intersect at two points, then we know that the b squared minus the 4ac will be greater than 0. Um, as we've already done a question very similar to this on the paper already. Uh, multiply through by 2 is going to give me 10 plus x minus 1 squared is equal to minus x plus 2k. Um, expanding those brackets is going to give me x squared minus 2x plus 1. Uh, whoops. Uh, setting it all equal to um, all, all, all on one side. Adding 1 is going to give me minus x, and that's going to be 9, uh, sorry, 11 uh, minus 2k is equal to 0. Now let's inspect uh, the discriminant. So we're going to get um, b squared, which is minus 1, because there's only minus 1x there minus 4 lots of a, which is 1, 
and then the C value is 11 minus 2K. And we want that greater than zero. So this gives me one minus um, 44 and plus 8K. So we get that 8K is greater than uh, 43. So k is greater than 43 over 8. And you would think you're done. You think you've done everything right, but no. Edexcel are playing you because this is not the full correct answer. And let me explain why. It's because we're not actually using this whole curve. We're actually using only a portion of this curve. And it's the portion in which the parametrics satisfy the domain that's been given. And we can notice that by the sketch not being a full quadratic. It cuts off. So we've just solved the, the question um, what would happen if a line intersected that full quadratic? So the full quadratic would look like this. And we've basically just shown that if I had that line and it went through this point here, um, which was 43 over 8 was the intercept, um, then it would cut once. So therefore that intercept had to be greater than that value so that it would cut multiple times. Anywhere, raising that, that intercept up, it will cut multiple times. But we're not examining that full quadratic, we're examining this partial curve here. And in fact, it will cut twice along here, but as soon as we get as high up as here, it's only gonna cut once. So we need to figure out how high up that green line is. Well, let's inspect this point right here, the point at the end of the domain. At that point, the t value is equal to minus pi over four uh, because the domain starts here at minus pi over four. So let's find an x and y coordinate using our parametric equations for that particular point. So I go to my calculator and I press um, 2 um, tan of minus pi over 4 and then I want to plus 1 and I get minus 1 which makes sense. You can see that roughly speaking minus 1 is a, is a, is a uh, sort of you know respectable not respectable a feasible x coordinate and then the y value um, we would have to go over here and I've actually got this already in my calculator so let's let's just change this to a minus and we should be good and that also gives you seven great so the y value equals seven. So let's find what the k value is of this green line. So I know that it goes through this point here and I know the gradient is minus a half. So if I do y minus y1 is equal to minus a half x minus minus one. I get that um, y minus seven is equal to minus a half x minus a half. So y is equal to minus a half x um, plus 6.5 or 13 over two. And that is the y intercept. So that is the k value right here that the 
line cannot exceed because otherwise if it did exceed it it would go across like this and it would only cut that u shape once uh, so we can say that k must be in between uh, 43 over 8 uh, because when it is 43 over 8 it just crosses um, just once which is not enough so therefore it's not equal to um, and between the new one we found which is 13 over 2 and that one is equal to because when it does cross at that k value you can see it cuts twice but anything more than that it would not cut twice, it would only cut once. And we are done. Thanks very much for watching. I've got lots more videos on A-level exam papers and I'm going to be posting way more videos as well over the exam period. So please do subscribe. Thank you very much. And for now, bye-bye.